Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Bernie Krause. He's an American musician and soundscape ecologist. In 1968, he founded Wild Sanctuary, an organization dedicated to the recording and archiving of natural soundscapes. Krause is an author, a bioacoustician, a speaker, and natural sound artist. He helped define the field of study of soundscape ecology. So, first off, thank you for your work, and second, thank you for being on the program. Oh, you're very welcome, Derek. Um, so, what is soundscape ecology? Soundscape ecology is the study of sound in the landscape, and what I concentrate on is um, the sounds that are produced by all organisms in a given habitat. And the soundscape is, um, I guess we should define some terms here, the soundscape is a narrative of place, and it's the language that conveys where we are and whether that place is urban or rural or a wild habitat. And I guess we could go a little further. The soundscape is comprised of of three basic sources of sound. The first and original source of sound on the planet was the geophony. Geo meaning earth. It's the it's the suff, it's the prefix uh, coming from the Greek uh, geo uh, and phone meaning sound. Uh, so the sounds of the earth that are natural sounds like wind in the trees or water in the stream, waves at the ocean shore, that kind of thing. And the second of these uh, 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 component of the soundscape is the biophony, bio meaning life and phone again meaning sound, so sounds of living organisms. And the third is the anthropophony. Anthropophony is all of the sounds that we humans generate. Uh, some of it is controlled, like music and liter- uh, music and theater um, uh, and language. And uh, uh, most of the sound that we make is incoherent or chaotic, which we call noise. And uh, that has a profound effect on the way that, uh, because we're so noisy now, it has a profound effect on the biophony. And um, also our, ex- our our experience of the natural world, because uh, we, when we make so much noise, um, we we obliterate that which is the more natural and, uh, and really, um, you know, life-affirming for us. Um, there, there's so many directions I want to go with this, and I hope we get to go a bunch of them. Um, one is that over the the decades, so many people have written to me, and I'm sure the same thing has happened to you, to say, I don't hear the sounds I used to hear. And a great example right here is every... Every March and April, where I live now, I live in far northern California, um, f- 17 years ago when I first moved here, uh, the tree frogs were so loud at night that you could not hold a human conversation outside at night. It was, it was just too loud to hear each other. And every spring now, I wonder, is this a spring I won't hear any? Because they've gotten less and less loud until... Now you can easily stand outside. You'll hear two or three frogs, which is very different than hearing two or three hundred. Yeah, um, or thousands. Um, the, the frogs here have come back, and uh, there was a period uh, from around 2011 to 2015 that we heard hardly any, and that was the that was really at the height of the California drought, which was historically the worst drought that's occurred in 1,200 years. Um, so it was it was a serious one. As a matter of fact, a place that I'd been recording, a place called Sugarloaf State Park. I'm I'm just south of you, about a five hour drive, and um, in a, in Sonoma Valley, and there's a ridge of hills. Sometimes they call them mountains uh, that that divides Sonoma and Napa Valleys, and um, I've been recording at that at a place called Sugarloaf. State Park, which is uh, on that ridge. And in 2015, it was the first silent spring I've ever experienced in my life. I've been recording there for 20 years and uh, since we moved to this valley, and 
I can tell you that it was one of the most shocking experiences of my life uh, to hear, to see birds. I mean, there were birds, certainly, but none of them were singing. It was absolutely dead silent. So if you can imagine that uh, and kind of extrapolate, you know, where we might be headed with this, it's um, it's it's pretty dystopian. You know, I've I'm sure you have too. I've read so many accounts, no matter whether they're in in Ohio or what's I mean, what's now Ohio or what's now um, Iowa or or in what's now Washington State of the early European explorers sometimes saying that the noise the, the, the noise is the wrong word the the biopony was so loud that they couldn't sleep and sorry go ahead well I, you're absolutely right that observation is right too and what I do in my book, the in my recent book, the, the Great Animal Orchestra: Finding the Origins of Music in the World's Wild Places, the the introduction to that book is a description of what the sounds were like um, uh, about sixteen thousand years ago, and uh, we know that from the fossil records and, and and other ways of determining that. But it was it was incredible, and. <laughs> And what these creatures needed to do, speaking of the biophony, is they needed to find um, uh, acoustic niches for themselves, which we call the acoustic niche hypothesis, so that their voices wouldn't be masked. And so they found these frequency and temporal niches where their voices could be heard. And, and to be sure, there's still some of that today, but the density of and diversity of, of creature voices over my lifetime, and I'm uh, next year I'll be 80 years old. Over my lifetime, has diminished exponentially. Uh, no matter where I go, whether it's a desert or a rainforest, uh, whether it's tropical rainforest, mostly undisturbed. Uh, in other words, there hasn't been any logging there, but certainly there are humans everywhere on the planet. But there isn't a place that I've gone where uh, there hasn't been a serious, notable, measurable reduction in the density and diversity of wildlife, of vocal wildlife. Um, let's talk for a moment about the um, the <coughs> effects, and and I want to talk about both the effects on on non humans and the effects on humans, uh, and you can go whichever way you want first of the ascendancy of noise over the biophony and and I, maybe maybe try humans first what is what do you, what what do you what are the effects of growing up uh, of growing up and living in a a world filled with other voices a, a world in which we evolved and and the a world filled with the sound of diesel engines and Two cycles and 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 not so many frogs. Well, I, the, the best example I can give is I grew up in the Midwest and uh, um, just outside of Detroit in the nineteen late nineteen thirties and early nineteen forties, and I recall being in my bedroom at night when there were still. Uh, when the land was still undeveloped and there were these vast fields that went for miles, uh, part of the Wisconsin glacier uh, that disappeared again 15, 16,000 years ago. But um, uh, that whole area was filled with wildlife sound, and those are the those are the are the symbolic sounds that are really engraved in my mind, and I can hear recall that soundscape today as I, as clearly as I heard it on those evenings when I was three and four years old in the spring. So, yeah, um, but that's all gone now. Um, uh, and many, and as it happens, I have a library of maybe 5,000 hours of material from every place around the world, both marine and terrestrial. But a lot of it comes from, a large percentage of it comes from the United States and North America. And I can tell you that the rate of, of 
destruction of habitats in the U.S. has diminished the soundscape to the point where um, it's really it, it's really it, it's so troubling to me as a as a listener because I don't see very well, so my whole world is informed by sound. Uh, to me, it's it's a particular problem because I love these these uh, sounds so much. As a matter of fact, the very reason that I got into this field uh, uh, 50 years ago when um, I first actually heard the recordings and needed them for an album that my late music partner Paul Beaver and I were doing for Warner Brothers, um, uh, it just it made me feel good. It made me feel relaxed and, and, and um, just centered and part of the living world. The, uh, I have a terrible, terrible case of ADHD. I did as a kid, and I do as an adult. And the only thing, I mean, you can talk about medication all day long, but the only thing that works for me is uh, going to the field and just listening to these natural sounds. And I suspect that it's not a lot different for other people as well. Certainly, those groups that still live more closely connected to the natural world um, uh, do I- express exactly the same feeling when they come in contact with with the cash economies of the world and people who are related to that. They become very stressed, and then when they become so sick that they can't deal with it anymore, they just if, if there's any forest left for them, they go off into the forest for months at a time to heal. And part of that healing process is listening to the natural world sound. So I do the same thing. And I, I, um, <clears throat> yeah, the, whenever I'm on tour, um, I always, at the end of the day, um, you know, when I get done with the event, then I go back to my hotel room, I always pull the curtain shut and leave the lights off because when I'm in a cityscape, or when I'm in a city, I, I always end up my. I feel at the end of the day as though my skin has been braided, yeah. and a lot of that has to do. I'm both visually and then also um, through sound. Just there is so much. Uh, to use the word you used earlier, so much chaos, um, and I never feel that when I'm when I'm in a forest. I never feel overwhelmed, and I never feel. Um, I mean, this, this happens every single time I end up in a city. Well, th- there's a reason for that. Uh, when when you are in a natural environment that is wild, the narrative expressed through the biophony is a vast library of detail that together tells stories from many different perspectives, and it carries a lot of information in it. And one of those is the degree to which a habitat is thriving, but also... Because those sounds are cohesive sounds and they're, for the most part, non-threatening, um, it, it has an effect on us because those natural soundscapes are part of our DNA. Every one of us has that in our DNA. And it goes back to times, you know, before being atavistic. These These soundscapes... If you ask anybody where they want to go on a vacation, for instance, they'll tell you they want to go to the ocean or they want to go to the mountains or they want to go to the desert. They have these totem ideas about what they like um, and and what would make them feel good. Never mind that they bring all that crap with them to make a lot of noise and, and obliterate it. But their initial knee-jerk reaction, for the most part, is they want to get away to a place that has those kinds of... of um, resonances to them and 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 it, 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 it the problem is that because we're so connected in this society to technology and the technologies that deliver these sounds um, we never get a chance most of us never get a chance to really hear that and the other the other issue is that that is a problem to resolve is okay so let's say for instance we break away and and we get away to a place like the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, where there are no habit, habitats. Uh, there, there 
are no trails uh, there. I mean, it's truly wild. There, it's like Bill McKibben says, you can walk for a week in any direction and never hit a fence or, or a road. Um, uh, and and best of all, there's nothing to buy. <laughs> but the, the 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 problem is that if that the the place is wild because there are so few people there. But if, in the process of doing this stuff and and creating this idea that that the natural world cures us, where are we going to go that humans are going to partake in in that environment where we're not going to destroy that environment too? So what's left of of the natural world are places that very few of us have the ability or the willingness or the courage to go to because sometimes they're they're far away and very exotic we don't really understand them we feel much safer in places that we know um uh, but what are we going to do about that that we're encouraging people to do um to maintain the integrity of those environments those habitats I, that's that's a hugely important point, and yeah. can can you back up for a moment? And you said uh, I never back up. <laughs> no, you so. you said case. you said you said that there are all these narratives, and you've used that word a couple times. And I'm completely with you on that. And 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 I'm wondering if you can be more explicit and. Um, and help people who might not have thought of it that way to understand what what you mean by that. Well, what I mean by that is when I, when I say a narrative, these natural soundscapes inform almost every discipline we can think about. They inform uh, music. They inform architecture. They inform philosophy. They inform natural history. Uh, resource management um, they inform literature so it, it, there isn't a single discipline that you can mention to me that wouldn't have some connection to natural sound and when I say it's a narrative of place these narratives express some aspect of all of those subjects and that's why it, it's so engaging um, now What's interesting to me is that this idea, this concept, the wonder of exploration and looking into this has very little traction here in America. Um, it's been, impo- for instance, it's been impossible for me. I've looked for 25 years now for a home for this archive, and I haven't had one serious offer from any institution We'll get in institutions later, but the, the, I haven't had any uh, really serious offer. They just say, to, you know, drop a box of tapes off at our door, and uh, and we're Stanford or we're Harvard. We know what the hell to do with these archives uh, because we're very big institutions and very important. You've heard that expression before. Anyway, the um, uh, but in Europe or in Latin America or China or Russia or Indonesia, Africa, all of these areas of the world have some understanding of what, of how important this is. It's almost somebody once said to me, who was writing an article on this about the for the New Yorker magazine. They said, "Yeah, they said this is like the li- This is as important as the library at Alexa- of Alexandria. You know, the famous mythological library that disappeared in, in a big fire and everything. All of human history was wiped out." I'm exaggerating. But the, the the point is that it is really important. It's a critical um, history of sound and the soundscape uh, that's evolved over the last 50 years when the, um, when, when the damage to the natural world has been accelerated to the greatest extent and to the greatest degree. Once again, so many directions to go, and, and yeah, the 
the I want to come back to what you just said uh, and and the the valuing of this. Well, actually, let's go there first. That obviously, I would rather hear um, passenger pigeons for real than to hear a, a, a tape of them. But that doesn't alter the fact that I've read accounts first that the flocks of passenger pigeons, you know, would darken the sky for days at a time and would sound like rolling thunder. And the individual, I, I've read accounts by authors of the smaller flocks of birds and how it was, how their landing and their, that the sounds they made were, were, the authors described them as more beautiful than any symphony. Yeah. And, and we hear about how this culture is increasing our number of choices because now we can get 17 types or 77 types of toothpaste, but no one will ever hear the sound of a passenger pigeon again. Well, more than that, uh, Derek, I've, m- my library, like I said, I have 5,000 hours of material or so. Half of my library from, comes from habitats that are now either altogether silent or so, or so radically compromised uh, that they can that the biophonies can no longer be heard in any of their original form. That's half of my archive, and most of that comes from here in the United States, but it's also for the rest of the world as well. It's disappearing really fast. I mean, and and, and like I said, you know. We had the first silent spring I've ever heard in my life here in Northern California, just south of where you live. My mom is 84, and she often says that she is grateful that she is not younger because she doesn't want to experience even more of what we're talking about than she has already experienced. Yeah. I know exactly what she's saying, and I feel exactly the same way. Um, you talked about, um, you mentioned recording also marine situations. And people, I think, don't often think about um, fish making noise. But I recently heard... Um, some recordings of I don't know if they were yours of 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 the fish in coral reefs and it was just like it was its own equivalent of bird song. It yep. was it exactly was, right. So so talk about that for a moment. Well, I have two hundred different species of fish recorded in my archive, um, as well as crustaceans and and um, mammals, of course. But uh, uh, fish make noise. They make they they have uh, they put out a signature that's unique to each species of fish. Some of them produce some of the fish produce those sounds uh, with their swim bladder. Others produce the sound by gnawing on coral. Um, and and there's a new idea that, out there that that uh, some of them produce them by the oscillation and shape. Uh, and size of their of their caudal fin, their tail fins. So um, uh, they produce or introduce a signal in the water, and some of that is is uh, by um, a new thesis, um, which talks about sound not being generated in sound waves, but by particle theory or particle motion. So it's little particles of of um, it's the particles in the water are actually creating the sound them, and transmitting the sound themselves. It gets into a whole other thing we're not going to get into right now, but it it's very very interesting stuff because it's a new way of sound transmission that nobody had ever thought of or identified before. And those are um, either getting overwhelmed. By the, the marine soundscapes are also getting either overwhelmed by the noise or or silenced in other ways too. Yeah, because uh, the military is putting out huge amounts of noise, introducing it into the uh, natural world at levels that are really having 
a profound physical impact on on uh, marine mammals in particular, but fish also and um, and crustaceans. Um, uh, the the b- many vessels themselves, including the big transport vessels like uh, like uh, oil tankers and stuff like that, their propellers generate what's called cavitation noise, and um, uh, it's it's a noise that is truly loud and overwhelming. And so what it does in terms of some species of whales, it it masks their voices. Sometimes these whales, like a blue whale, for instance, uh, that live pretty much solitary lives, but have to communicate to other blue whales over hundreds of miles underwater. Uh, before they were able to do that, but now their voices, uh, their signals are masked by all of this um, uh, sound that's being generated by these mechanical devices that we've introduced into the marine environment. You know, the, the whole time we've been talking, I've been on the, the, the verge of tears for a couple of reasons. One is because of what's lost and also, and, and being lost, and, and also because of um, just the, the, the beauty of these soundscapes that, that are out there and that, I mean, it, it resonates. And when you talk about this, it then resonates back to, um, you know, the frogs in the spring or crickets or, you know, having been in the south during a cicada, um, invasion, um, invasion or <laughs> uprising or, yeah. or swarm or whatever word we want to use. Oh, bl- yeah. blooming. How's that? Yeah. Um, works. And, and so I guess another direction I want to go is so many indigenous people have said to me over the decades that their languages come from the land. And I, I don't want you to address that from an indigenous perspective, but can you address that from a soundscape perspective? You know, you talked about how soundscapes, how, how, how these narratives inform every part of our lives can you talk specifically about your perspective on how they inform especially language and especially music? Well, yes. Um, again, uh, that thesis is developed in, the, in the, the book The Great Animal Orchestra to a large degree. But basically, the time that I've spent with the Hivaro and the Amazon Basin and uh in connection with Louis Sarno's work uh, with the Bayaka in the Central African Republic, the Zanga Sanga rainforest of the Central African Republic, what these, what I found is, is that these groups are using the sound of the forest or the biophony as a natural karaoke orchestra with which they perform. Uh, so they're using it as their backup band, and uh, as soon as they hear a particular uh, combination of um, insects or frogs or mammals or maybe the whole thing, uh, they break into song that's related to exactly to that uh, particular moment of the soundscape. Um, they've learned their melody, uh, their idea of melody. They've learned their idea of composition, uh, organization of sound from the uh, rainforest sounds, the biophony. They've learned their rhythm from the biophony, um, and and they've learned their performance, the ways in which they actually perform their music um, uh, from the way that the biophony um, articulates itself. And they've learned dance because they've watched the animals move, and uh, consequently, um, they too have moved. Similar to uh, those movements of the of other animals, the, the the interesting thing is here that none of these groups that I've been connected with and that I know of from from others who've worked with uh, groups like Steve Feld and the um, and the uh, Kalali in Papua New Guinea um, and uh, Bruce Albert who does work with the Yanomami in northern Brazil, uh, all of these. Uh, uh, absur- 
people who've observed, like I've observed mostly from the outside, but certainly obser- observed them, uh, have, have understood the connection between the natural sound and their language development uh, because it relates the reason the different languages have developed is because there are different biophonies that have been the roots of their language the, the inspiration for their language so all of this ties together in a, in a, in a fascinating intricate way um, and uh, has been in place for a long time now all of that, uh, the Bayaka certainly because of um, uh, the intrusion of, of the Chinese and, and Europeans for the hardwood forests that they've lived in f- for millennia, uh, have seen their culture uh, compromised really greatly. The same thing with the uh, with the uh, Hivaro and the Amazon. Uh, all that of that is changing now with oil exploration and, and deforestation uh, for palm oil, for instance. So it's um, uh, it, it's changing. It's changing really rapidly. And one of the one of the sad things is that I was able to capture a lot of that and record that and have that in my archive um, as uh, an example of what these places sounded like at one point because you're not going to hear them any other way John Livingston wrote extensively about how um, we he, he asked the question what does it mean when the vast majority of our sensory perceptions are either created by or mediated by humans and especially machines yeah. And part of his thesis was that um, people living in echo chambers or people, if they put you into a sensory deprivation tank and all you have is yourself, that you begin to hallucinate. Yeah. And he was convinced that um, because most of us only receive information or perceptions created by or mediated by humans and especially machines that most of our ideologies then are what you would call hallucinations and and, and that they're was illusions. one of the they're illusions and one of the sources yeah. of our in, in, insane behavior oh there's no question about that there, there's a guy by the name of uh, Paul Shepard who wrote a very important book I mean it's it's the it's the inspiration for almost everything that I've done uh, and written. Uh, he wrote a book called The Others, How Animals Made Us Human. And he also wrote a book called Nature and Madness. And the premise of that book is that the further we draw away from the natural world, the more pathological we become as a culture. And if you don't believe that, just watch the news. So, an- another thing that um, I'm going to ask kind of an unfair question. And Oh, um, go for it, Derek. Give that, me the best shot. <laughs> the, well, the, the unfair question is, uh, on your, on your, on your website, uh, for the Wild Sanctuary, um, or for Wild Sanctuary, you, you mention at one point, um, beautiful soundscapes, and I'm not gonna ask you to choose one, cause I can't, I can't do that myself either, but what are some of the, most moving to you soundscapes that you have recorded or soundscapes that you wish that everyone could hear that's an, an unfair question at all it's a, it's a great question and um, uh, my favorite place to record has always been Alaska Alaska because in a state about a third the size of the whole United Lower 48 um, there are only 500,000 people there, no, 700,000 now, a little over 700,000. And um, uh, you can get away, you can get far away from uh, human encounters um, for long periods of time. There are always planes flying over, you know, occasionally every, uh, you know, every, you'll, you'll see one or two planes a day, but you're, you're a long way away from things. And uh, you can get out 
to places where there's still no development. That said, um, uh, places like the Yukon Delta, for instance, and it's one of my favorite albums because it's so rich and beautiful and lyrical, um, like you say, like a symphony. The, uh, the problem is, is that the tundra is melting all over Alaska now. When we went to the Arctic Refuge in, in, uh, to record in 2006, we had identified 21 places where we wanted, uh, to, that, from which we were going to choose before we took the three teams and, and, and set them up in different places. And uh, we got there June 1st uh, to, to Fairbanks. And when we began to talk to U.S. Fish and Wildlife guys, this game warden was really uh, on top of things and, and helping us out. Um, uh, we were told that 18 of those 21 places, the tundra was too soft. June 1st, the tundra was too soft to land, so we couldn't get to them. And the three places that we got to, it was clear that that um, even at that time of year, which usually doesn't happen until mid-June or late June, uh, already the tundra was beginning to melt to the point where um, what we were seeing was robins, American robins, 300 miles further north than they had ever been seen or heard before. And the Native Americans who were, who were living in uh, some of those very small villages in, in that area didn't even have a name for the bird because they'd never seen it before. So we're seeing and hearing things that are changing so rapidly now. But Alaska still by far, uh, the Yukon Delta, for instance, is a wonderful place. It's a place where millions of birds gather. They fly from as far away as, as Africa or New Zealand to converge on this one spot and breed in the very short summers that uh, the subarctic uh, you know uh, provides for them that's so really remarkable it's it's beautiful it's quite extraordinary and you're not distracted by uh by other humans around you you can be there for 2 weeks and not see one hello well go ahead yeah i'm sorry somebody picked up the line on the other end so what would be um you know, obviously, your recordings are no substitute for the real thing. No, they're an illusion. But, they're an abstraction. But, but um, given the given that we all understand that, what would be the uh, best use of your um, remarkable? Um, uh, collection ideally it would uh -huh. be it would be finding a home for it in an institution that was willing to teach the interdisciplinary relationships that are informed by soundscape ecology it would have as part of the institution uh, an academic chair in soundscape ecology somebody to teach that and there are a lot of people out there now who can do that, who are qualified. When I first began, when I got my Ph.D. in 1981, there were six people with a Ph.D. in, in bioacoustics. Now there are probably 2,000. And, uh, and it's exploding exponentially in terms of interest uh, in this work. Problem is, <laughs> as, people, as more and more people get engaged in it, there's less and less habitat to record. So that's definitely an issue, but it's it's there's no question that it's a huge it's it's an, a subject of huge interest, particularly again in Europe, but also it's beginning to get a little bit of traction here. Um, uh, and there are lots of ways to approach this thing. You can approach it from a humanities perspective by writing about it by. Um, um, doing a symphony if you want I just did a symphony called the Great Animal Orchestra based on the book with um, uh, uh, an Oxford composer colleague uh, Richard Blackford which was commissioned by the BBC Symphony Orchestra uh, we did a ballet um, 
we've done ballet for a professional group called the Alonzo King Lines Ballet, that, and and I helped a university, the um, uh, Sonoma State University here, uh, put on a ballet uh, for their group, for the student group. Uh, so there's lots of ways to do this and, and engage with this uh, culturally. Um, uh, you can put on these museum installations uh, for an art museum, contemporary art, or uh, just a museum installation in a in a uh, uh, like a natural history museum, or like the California Academy of Sciences, for instance. So, so there are all of these outlets for this material. Um, there are ways to engage with this material that actually provides a living without doing damage to the rest of the world. So you, when you're out there with a recorder, you're not hurting anything. You're not inter interacting with anything. You can set the recorder up in the forest and walk away for, you know, five, six hours at a time or a day or a week and still get your material and not affect what's going on wildlife-wise around, uh, you know, in a natural habitat. So what I'd like to see is I'd like to see this archive as the basis for um, a whole new field, uh, found, find a place in an institution, I'd like to see students interested in it and teachers um, uh, interested in conveying this great information because it's the most interesting stuff that's come along the pike in a long, long time. And unfortunately, it's at a transition period where we've got to decide whether we're going to protect these areas or, you know, just let them go. And who's going to put the energy and, and, and resources into it to make that happen? So I'm I'm gonna we would sort of have a, a nice sort of transition to a wind down question, but I want to I want to ask you something else first, which is something I missed earlier, which is if we've talked some about the effects of of this diminishing soundscape on humans, what in, in your experience what are the effects how 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 does if we drop off habitat hab, if we drop off um non sonic habitat loss cuz now i'm counting thanks to you i'm counting the soundscape as part of habitat if we drop if we drop off it's the, the problems, voice it's the voice of the natural world and and what happens to the natural world as that voice is diminished what what cascading effects does that have on the non-humans themselves as, they're, as they are drowned out by machines, basically? Well, they don't even have to be drowned out by machines. When you do a clear cut or you do um, uh, selective logging, for instance, it has a profound effect on the biophony. And when, and when one creature that's, that's helped serve as an underpinning for the biophony in that particular habitat is is lost all of the other creatures uh, fall into a chaotic uh, way of expressing themselves um, because that gap is missing and that, that underpinning that, that, that was so important to the whole biophony is missing so they struggle for sometimes long periods of time sometimes uh, decades to find that balance again, that that bioacoustic balance that is so necessary to maintain the integrity, certainly the the bioacoustic integrity of that habitat, and that's really key. When those voices drop out, it's like, gee, it's like the string section dropping out in Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Something's missing. And it affects all the other creatures. So I guess I guess two last questions. Um, one of them is that I mentioned early on that so many people have written to me to say that things are much quieter than they used to be. And it seems that everything you're talking about we have and you said yourself you remember things from when you were three and four and is that your experience of is that your experience of other people's experience of your work is to come to you um in with with 
strong emotion associated with the sounds of meadowlarks when they were a child or the sounds of, of red-winged blackbirds? Is this is your experience that so many people have that powerful bonding with those sounds? I get that a lot. As a matter of fact, I did a, um, a piece called um, about habitat loss and, and particularly, uh, particularly the soundscape. Uh, that was done uh, for CNN last year. It was called Great Big Story, and it's on YouTube. You can actually see it, and it's had over two million views. And the, the the interesting thing about it is is how many responses we've got uh, that are truly heartrending. Um, they're they're deeply felt, and uh, and the comments are. You know, usually you get somebody doing a snide remark or something like that, but there isn't hardly any of that here in the response to this piece. And it shows how deeply ingrained and how deeply felt this is across really um, um, many people's experience in this uh, with this subject. So I agree. I think it's very important to think about, and and uh, it's certainly been my experience that 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 people other people feel is not just you and me you know i became an an environmentalist really because when i was in second grade that'd be 1967 1968 i was seven years old yeah they put in a subdivision near where i lived and the meadowlarks disappeared and i recognized even in second grade i didn't have this language but i recognized the meadowlarks are gone and they keep building in subdivisions, the meadowlarks will have nowhere to go. Yeah. And so my point is that the sound of meadowlarks is is what put me on the path I'm on today. Yeah, it's really pretty. It's a, it's a gorgeous sound, whether it's eastern or western. So given that this culture is just grinding away at the planet, what... What what do you want people to do regarding especially soundscapes? What what can we do to help 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 stop this destruction of the greatest symphony ever? Well, we've got to learn to shut the hell up and um, and pay some attention to the beauty that's around us. To me, I, I'm not a religious person, but to me, that soundscape, that biophony, is the voice of the divine. And it's the it's the way that that the others are reaching out to us and screaming at the top of their little lungs as as much as they can to say, "Shut up, be quiet, quiet down, get to know us a little bit and and get to understand how important this is to your lives." And to the extent that we're able to do that, great. And to the extent we're not, I guess it's not going to work out too well. And we have a, and and we're at that point where it's a critical decision to make. Well, I would like to thank you very much for your work and for being on the program. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Bernie Krauss. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. <laughs> 